All right, we are finally live. Hello, everyone. What's going on? Welcome back to the live stream. If this is your first time joining us or you're watching the playback, we do live streams every single day at 5 p.m., except for today when I was chronically late. I was in the middle of something, uh, and I tried to do the live stream from Starbucks to try and get things to work. Some of you guys were there in that first attempt, and you know that it just it was unsuccessful, and I apologize for that. But normally, on normal days, we do live streams at 5 p.m. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys about today because there are a few things that are kind of changing in my life over the next couple of months. And I wanted to share that with you guys. You know, like I, I love sharing kind of my journey with you all. I kind of, uh, I, I, I like to kind of keep you updated on my journey with God and my praying and da da da. And, and, and some things have been, uh, been taking place that have been, that that have that I want to share with you guys, basically. So long story short, here's 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 what's going on. For for the last while now, I have been praying, as many of you guys know, that YouTube ministry would be able to kind of be my number one go-to way of earning money. It would be my calling, my job, etc., etc., etc. Um, and for the last little while, it's been a a, a large struggle to make that work. YouTube is largely supported through my Patreon members, uh, the Super Chats, which is available right now in case you want to do a Super Chat during this live stream. Occasionally, I get uh, like brand deals and things like that. But when it's all said and done, YouTube is only able to cover on a good month, maybe about 50% of my expenses on a given month. Um, the other 50% of my time is dedicated towards... Uh, doing contract work, creating videos for local businesses in the Northwest area, shooting videos for them and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I actually quite enjoy that specific job. It's thankfully it happens to be with my brother-in-law. And so I get to work with family. It's on a project that I'm very, very excited about. I'm passionate about. I love, um, but at the end of the day, it's still not 100% aligned with what I believe my calling to be. I am unfortunately not creating content to help equip young people to discover God better for themselves and understand the Bible and like that whole, like that whole thing that I really am passionate about and I'm really excited to be able to do. Well, this is where the change is coming up in my life. Something has happened. I've had a conversation in the last couple of weeks with a friend who runs a ministry that I am super stoked about. Uh, this guy's name is Jonathan. I'll probably in the next next couple of months introduce you guys to him. Uh, probably end up doing a collaboration and stuff like that with him. But this guy is uh, a guy who travels pretty much around the country, around the world, speaking and preaching and teaching young people about their identity in Christ uh, and specifically how that identity leads to liberty and really helping like you kind of, um, how do I want to say this, uh, experience God's best for your life. I don't, I don't know. That seems really, really cliche. He came and spoke in Oregon uh, this last summer, really great series of meetings. And a couple of weeks ago, I got to do coffee with this guy. We weren't planning on this, but the conversation led and kind of to summarize everything, I am going to be joining him in his ministry uh, as part of his team, actually as kind of like the social media manager of the ministry that he runs. And so that means that that other half of my income, that other 50% of what I was doing, uh, as far as doing contract work with other people and things like that, that 50% over time is actually going to be replaced with doing contract work and doing contract ministry stuff on YouTube for this guy's ministry, which I'm super stoked about because it's a message that I really believe in. It's a message that has challenged me and I believe is is kind of taking me to the next level in my walk with God. And I'm going to be kind of the guy, the wizard behind the scenes, helping to create content to promote this message out there for the world to see. And I am so stoked about that. And so actually, at, in about a month, uh, yeah, the beginning of next month, I'm going to be traveling to Hawaii, which sounds awesome, right? Just on the outset, but he's doing a series of meetings for like 10 days in Hawaii. So I'll be traveling there. The sad part is I have to leave Ronan and Emily at home, but I'm going to go to Hawaii and work with this guy, shoot a bunch of his content, record his meetings, 
and start to create videos for him. And I'm so excited about this because this is really one of the first major steps into what I've been praying about and thinking about and working towards for the last almost three years. Two years ago, oh yeah, yeah, uh, I got a, like a time hop thing coming up in my Facebook. Two years ago, almost to this day, my channel was still like nothing, like a tiny little plant. I think it had 5,000 subscribers. I was celebrating 5,000 subs two years ago today. And now we're at like 65,000 and it's still growing and the community is getting deeper and it's, and it's so cool to see all of you guys here in the live chat. I think I saw someone earlier who was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm here for the second time. And, and it's just like, that's awesome. Like we're growing and we're making an impact on people's lives. And I'm just so excited to be able to not only do that with you guys, but to take that experience and kind of add that to someone else's ministry that I believe in that I'm going to be amplifying. And it's, and it's going to be so, I, I don't know. I, I don't know ultimately if it's going to work. You know, I might come back to you guys three months from today and be like, oh my goodness, guys, I made a huge mistake. This was not the partnership that I wanted or I was praying for. I made a mistake. I, that could be the case. And I don't know, you know, I'm just kind of going by faith, but I'm really excited about this. I think that this actually really could be the beginning of something incredible. And, and to me, that's awesome because I've been working so hard for this. I've been praying for this and like being someone who makes content on YouTube, like within the Christian sphere, like being a Christian YouTuber, or a Christian vlogger, um, it's kind of a lonely road. There's not a lot of people doing that. I mean, I've tried to connect with pretty much everybody I know that's doing it. You know, Paul and Morgan, Savannah Louie, uh, John Jorgensen, you know, there's a handful of people and there's a couple more that I still want to reach out to and connect with. But by and large, it's a very small community. And so I'm super stoked to be able to add additional people onto the, the platform and to help them and to, and to work with them and to mentor and partner with. It's like, it's going to be so, I'm really looking forward to it. And I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I'm super grateful. I feel like God has been working, which obviously God has been working, but I really feel like this is potentially part of the, um, my, the answer to the prayers I've been praying. And so w one, I want to share that journey with you guys. And so I'll be making content about that kind of stuff. And who knows in the next month or so, I might be doing little live streams from Hawaii or something like that. So I want to share that journey with you. Number one, but number two, I want to share with you guys, guys, if, if God has placed a dream on your heart, if God has placed a mission and a calling on your life and, and you, you kind of see what that is, but there's obstacles that that are in the way. I want to encourage you to not give up on those those dreams and those missions. And the reason why is because it's so easy to to get discouraged when challenges arise and when obstacles come. But you don't have to be. Sometimes God's timing is different than our timing. Sometimes we want it to happen today when God says no, it's happening tomorrow or maybe a year or two or three down the line. But at the end of the day, God's God knows best, right? The Bible talks about how his ways are higher than our ways and his, 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 um, uh, he's smarter. He's uh, what's, what's the word? Your ways are, are better than our ways and higher than our ways, right? Or, or whatever the text is. I, I'm like blanking. Cause I'm like excited about all this. I apologize. I want to challenge you guys. And I want to challenge myself. And it's a reminder for myself every single time to have faith in what God is doing. It might not always be the way that you want it to, in fact, probably most of the time it's frustrating. Like I know I've been there, but God's in control and he's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. And I'm excited to kind of share that with you guys. And I want to hope and pray that you guys hang on because uh, whatever God calls you to, I think it's going to be awesome. I, I really, really believe that God has a plan for your life, that God has a calling on your life, that he actually wants to use you to change the status quo. I don't know how, I don't know in what way, um, but I think that's what he's calling you to. So don't settle for anything less. Uh, don't allow that vision or dream to get snatched away from you because you're discouraged or because it's hard. Put in the time, do the work and, and see God come through because it's cool. It's, it's awesome. And, and I, I want you to experience it because my life has never been 
the same since I started to allow God to lead. So that's the update. The TLDR, for those of you guys who joined in the, like the last couple of minutes, the TLDR is uh, I'm partnering with another guy who's doing ministry online and I'm going to be going to Hawaii next month for a couple of days to help him create content to launch a new YouTube channel. And it's been the answer to my prayers. I'll introduce him to you guys in a couple of weeks or months or whenever the time is appropriate. And of course, I'll be linking to some of the videos that we're working on his channel and all that kind of stuff and as time develops. Um, but that's kind of the TLDR. Sorry, that was like a 10 minute description of what's going on. Um, but yeah, super stoked about it. Anyways, I promised that I would extend this live stream because I was late to this one. So we'll, we'll hang out here. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts, your guys' questions, whether it's on this subject about my personal journey or any other questions on life, on the Bible, on your walk with God or anything else like that. So start, let me know what you're thinking in the comments below. We'll, we'll do that. Just want to give you guys a heads up as I always do. Um, to be subscribed to the channel number one, we're doing live streams five o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time every single day for the next couple of weeks. That's my goal. I'll, I'll miss it sometimes like today, but that's the goal. Second announcement is that Super Chat is available for this uh, live stream. We're going to have a bunch of comments going on, as you guys can see on the screen already. If you want your question answered, I respond to 100% of the Super Chats. It displays your question on the screen, and for like a dollar or something like that, it basically lets you know, this is a question I need to address. I'll respond to 100% of those. Of course, the, not that you have to support, but uh, the best way to look at Super Chat is simply saying, hey, Justin, I love what you're doing. I want to support. I, I buy into the mission and I want to contribute and give back. That's really what Super Chat is about. It's not really about paying to see your comment highlighted or anything else like that. It's just partnering with me in ministry. So if that's something that you want to do, right at the bottom of the chat window, there's a little dollar sign. You can hit that, give a dollar to something like that uh, and to Super Chat. But with that said, um, let's go ahead and look at some of the questions, comments from uh, today's live stream. Oh, one other announcement, third announcement. Sorry, there's a lot of announcements. We'll get to the live stream. We'll, we'll do a longer live stream today. I know that you guys like questions. But the third announcement is, have you guys seen the video I did with uh, John Jorgensen yet? You guys got to check out that Check that out. We've been promoting this book like crazy. It's not a sponsored post. Like I'm not getting paid to do this. I actually genuinely love this book. It's been challenging me. It's Letters to the Church, Francis Chan. It's an incredible book. Um, and uh, I'm doing a, an entire 10-part series with John Jorgensen about this book, wrestling through what is the church, what's the purpose of the church, where, where is the church falling short, and how can we help it get it to where God wants it to be. So check out that video on my channel. There's another one on John's. The next two videos will be released on Monday. If you are a patron, check out patreon.com slash that Christian vlogger because I actually released the entire series to patrons uh, for free. Uh, so you guys can check that all out. With that said, those are all the announcements that I can think of. Let me pause and think, make sure I didn't miss anything. Any other announcements? Anything else? No, I don't think I have anything else. All right, cool. Let's go to the questions. Let's go to the live chat, guys. We got a bunch of people hanging out here, 50 people watching live right now and pr probably many hundreds more on the playback. Do me a favor, if you're watching this live on the playback, smash that thumbs up button, share this video with a friend so they can find this content as well. Let me know if you're excited about this. Let's go ahead and dive into the questions. Let's find out what you guys are wanting to talk about. Always EJD says, just saw part one of the Letters to the Church series. Good start. Glad that you're joining us on that. Uh, I'll be sure to include questions that you want to have John and I talk about. Perhaps uh, after all 10 videos are released, we will do a roundup following up with questions that you guys have specific to that series. So I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that. Um, let's see what other kinds of questions. Let me see right here. Kevin's asking, why did God create so many planets in the solar system? I think part of this is, and of course, I don't have like a definitive biblical answer, but part of God's nature is that God is creative. In fact, if you go to Genesis chapter one, actually, you know what? I do have a Bible verse for this. Um, Genesis chapter one, the very first thing that we learn about God is number one characteristics. Check this out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want, you to, I want you to focus on that word created because the very first attribute that God reveals about himself to us in the book is that God is creative. For whatever reason, God loves to create things. And perhaps when you and I get to create things, whether those are YouTube videos, blogs, 
podcast, we get to draw art or music or create human beings that when we're creating, in a certain sense, we're tapping into the very nature of who God is. Why did God create so many solar systems? Probably just because it was fun. Probably just because he enjoys it. God is creative and he has fun creating. That's why we as human beings love creating because we're created in God's image. It's probably like the same thing. Why do you like to go and play soccer? Why do you enjoy uh, creating music? Why do you enjoy spending time with your friends? Why? Simply because it's fun. Because it brings you joy. Why does God create? Because it brings him joy. You bring him joy. When you're living out his calling and purpose in your life, God is creative. He creates because it brings him joy. Great question. Let's see what else here. Um, Let's see. <laughs> Just now, I'm learning sign language. Just wanted to say that. Very cool. I don't know any sign language. I know like, um, is I think this, what is this? Hi. What is this? How are you or something like that? That's all I really know. And that might even be wrong. <laughs> Caleb, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Caleb. Caleb, I see in the live chat, what's the best way to witness to legalistic Christians? Caleb's a good friend of mine. Caleb, thank you for joining us online in the live stream. I don't think I've ever have, had you in the live stream before. What is the best way to witness to legalistic Christians? My opinion on this would be, and of course there's like many things that you could do, but this is the one that comes to the top of my head. The best way to witness to legalistic Christians is to demonstrate true, authentic, and godly joy. Joy peace, and happiness. In my experience as a legalistic Christian, because I had many years as a legalistic Christian, as you know, Caleb, uh, I didn't always have joy. There were moments of joy, but the overarching theme of my experience during uh, my legalism was not joy. It was more so duty. There's nothing wrong with duty. Duty is good, but I wouldn't say that that was my primary motivation. Uh, that was my primary driver. And so one of the great things about leaving legalism and stepping into the grace and peace of Jesus, right, is that I have joy. I have peace and I have happiness in my life. And I think that when legalistic Christians see that, that, that you truly love the Lord, that you're happy, you're peaceful, you have joy in your life, there's a part of them that says, wow, that's different and I want that. So that's what would be my, my opinion on that one. Thanks for the question, Caleb. Thanks for hanging out and being such an awesome dude, Caleb. Looking forward to seeing you guys, uh, seeing you uh, in the next couple of, was it weeks or something like that? I'll be seeing you soon. I know that. All right. <laughs> RC says, being a legalistic Christian is like living on a very strict diet. That, that can be true. There's nothing wrong with a strict diet. Like I've, I've done some very strict diets before, but I get what your point is. Good stuff. Um, Let's see. Uh, Justin Ellie is asking, what, uh, is your favorite color red? Yeah, what gave it away? Was it possibly my shirt, the chair, the ring, perhaps the, uh, what is it, the, the, the logo right here? Yeah, red is my favorite color. The tripod that I'm, uh, my camera is resting on is red. Um, my mouse pad is red. This was actually sent to me by a marketing company. I would never pay for this. Uh, this seems a little gaudy, but I didn't have a mouse pad and I ended up using this for my mouse. Uh, anything else that's red in the my car is red. Um, my dog wears a red collar most of the time. Like, yeah, red is absolutely my favorite color. Let's see. Um, is your wedding ring made of rubber? That's what it looks like. Yeah, it is. Uh, it would be hard to get like a red metal. Um, let me see if I can get the camera to focus on it. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. There you go. This is my red ring and it is made out of rubber. Really handy for when you want to go outdoors, hiking, going to the gym, or traveling. That way you don't really ever stand to lose much if you lose the ring. I mean, still 20 bucks, so you don't want to lose 20 bucks. But comparing losing 20 bucks to losing like a couple thousand dollars for a wedding ring, I'll take the 20 bucks for sure. All right, let's see. Yes, all of them gave it away. Your shirt, your ring, your chair, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what kind of camera do you use? I use a Sony A7S Mark III. Um, and I saw a question that was good or how do you deal with rejection and haters? Okay. Um, how do you deal with rejection and haters? Let me look up this verse for, um, you will be. Okay. So one thing that I want to uh, talk about as far as, um, rejection is concerned is that rejection is not always a bad thing. In fact, hate, hate, haters and rejection can actually be some of the best 
teachers. Um, even Jesus was rejected. In fact, Jesus was rejected quite often. The very climax of his ministry was the ultimate rejection of Jesus by humanity. And so this is important to realize that if Jesus was perfect and he was rejected, how much more should we expect to be rejected if we are not perfect? Okay, think about that. Many times we think, oh, if only I did something different or if I did something better, then I wouldn't be rejected. This is not always the case. In fact, I would argue that the more you are like Jesus, the more you will actually experience rejection. So rejection is not a bad thing. We need to fix that in our mind. A lot of times we think, oh no, I'm being rejected. People don't like me. Oh, boo hoo, boo me. Like, no, rejection should be expected. Rejection is okay. It's not a terrible thing, okay? Check this out. Um, there's a principle here in Luke chapter six and verse 40. Is that the one I want to, is that what I want to do? No, no, actually John 15. Let me go to John 15. Sorry about that. I found a better verse. John chapter 15 and let's go to verse 20. I saw the super chat. I'll acknowledge it in a second. Let me finish answering this question. Luke chapter or John chapter 15 and verse 20. Here's what it says. Remember the word that I said unto you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, you can also substitute the word rejected or hated, right? If, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will also keep yours. Okay. So the principle that Jesus is saying is, listen, I was rejected. You're going to get rejected. I was hated. You're going to be hated. It's not always bad when people don't like you. I think actually the scriptures talk about, or maybe it's just one of those secular proverbs, that uh, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Let me look that up. Woe to you when all, yeah, when all speak well of you. Is that a Bible verse? Yeah, Luke chapter 6. In fact, it's, it's, it's the words of Jesus. Let me pull this up. Luke chapter 6, and let's go to verse 26. Okay. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. In other words, Jesus is saying this concept where we live life and people aren't complaining and aren't attacking you, this, this isn't a good thing. You don't want this. Why? Because when you live righteously, when you live like Jesus, you experience the reactions that Jesus experienced, rejection and, and hatred, persecution at times. So how do I deal with this? I remember my master, his experience, his character, his demeanor when he was going through this. And I remember what Jesus did is he loved them and he prayed for them. So that's how I deal with it. Great question. Thank you so much for that. Let's pull up the super chat. Thank you so much. We got two super chats. First super chat by my friend IB. Of course, not reading the name, but he says legalism was a problem early in my fart ministry. You know, I, I'm really curious as to what's the story behind this fart ministry. For those of you guys joining us for the first live stream in for a while, we've been doing live streams a bunch lately and we've had IB sharing super chats over the last couple of days, which I really appreciate. Thank you very much for the support. But he has this thing about fart ministry and he sent me a message earlier today that was absolutely hilarious. I was laughing out loud. Uh, I'm really curious to know the story behind that. So if you're still watching, let us know what's going on. What's the story behind the fart ministry? Second super chat, always EJD with a 199 super chat. Thank you very much. Says, why do church members leave the church? Okay, there is a, there is a, <laughs> there's a lot I could say on this. Actually, I've said 10 episodes worth of answering this basic question. Again, plugging the letters to the church conversation between me and John. Um, but why do people leave the church? First thing I want to say is there is a misunderstanding of what the quote unquote church is. Leaving the church, that phrase assumes that the church is a place, that the church is a building, that the church is even like a denomination. But that's not true. That's not what the church is actually is. The church is the body of believers. You are the church. I'm the church. It is impossible to leave the church because you are the church. How could you ever leave yourself? Now you can leave the faith. You could stop becoming a, being a Christian or something like that. I, and I get what you're actually trying to say, but I'm trying to make a point saying that there is no such place or thing as a church aside from you and me. It is not possible to leave the church. You simply stop becoming the church. You, you no longer are the church because you give up the faith. So the real question is why do people give up the faith? Why do they, why do they give up uh, their walk with God? Perhaps a number of different reasons. Uh, they stopped believing they weren't intentional about it. And they so slowly drift away. They had a bad experience and they give it up. Uh, a lot of times uh, tragedy strikes and people say, if God was good, why would he allow this? There's many different reasons why people leave the faith. What I'm interested more is why do people stay? 
And what do we do as the church? What's the function of the church? And I really believe that one of the, the remedies to stopping young people from leaving the church, right, is to understand the church has a mission and a calling. And when the church, when you and I are engaged in mission and calling, then we actually don't ever feel the need to leave. That even when you're like me and you feel in a certain respect on the outskirts of the church, you still remain the church because you have a mission and a calling. Even though for the last several years, I've struggled with my relationship to the church, I've still remained rooted in Christ, doing ministry like this, serving in other contexts. Why? Because I realize the church is not a place, it's not a building. I am the church. And if I want to see the church change, I need to be the change in the church that I want to see. Does that make sense? A lot of young people, they're leaving the church nowadays because there's hypocrites and there's problems and there's all these different kinds of things. And I'm sympathetic and I understand why you're doing this because I was there and in many respects, I still am there. But have a, a, a bigger perspective on it. The church isn't a place. You are the church. Be the change that you want to see. Be the person that you wished reached out to you and mentored you. Or if you actually had and you were fortunate to have someone like that, be the person that made the difference in your life to somebody else. Be what Jesus has called you to be. Be the church. Amen. Come on. I didn't even have coffee today. And I'm stoked. Actually, no, that's not true. I did have one cup of coffee. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's see right here. Uh, Zenprox got a good question. Zenprox, one of the mods in the, in the chat. Thank you so much for your service. Appreciate it. Justin, what does our Lord say about people suffering from not having money and in debt and being jealous of other people's possessions? Okay. First thing I'll say in relation to being jealous of other people's possessions, you guys know the Ten Commandments, right? Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. What does God say about wanting other people's things? Okay. He says, verse 17 of Exodus 20, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. In other words, Jesus or, or the Bible is making it very clear that we should not have this sense that, oh, I wish I had something that they had. Why? Because it believes the trap that things are what bring us happiness. And the truth is that is not the case. Your life would not actually be happier or better if you got the newest iPhone or the latest uh, 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 shoes or whatever the case is. In a certain respect, I get it. If you have nothing and you're like destitute, and we'll get to that in a second, there is an upgrade that takes place in life. But after a certain place, there is a diminishing return on your investment. The happiness that you get from getting a, the, the newest car or the latest video game or the latest, uh, I don't know, jewelry or what, whatever it is that you wish that you had from someone else, at a certain point, it actually doesn't impact your life. The, the, the myth that the world wants to tell you, the myth of every, every business that's out there and every marketing campaign that's out there is if you buy my stuff, you'll be happier. And I want to say no, false. This is why coveting is so dangerous because it helps you buy into that lie. The only thing that brings you true happiness and joy is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? How many rich and wealthy people are miserable? How many people that have everything that you could possibly hope for, every, every kind of success that you could be wishing for, how many of them are actually feeling empty inside? You see, I went to the Philippines a number of years ago on a mission trip, and I saw people who were dirt poor, like third world country, living and wearing like the, living in, 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 in a state of destitute, wearing perhaps the only clothes that they own. And yet I found out that they were not poor. There's a different kind, there's poor and there's poverty, right? You could be in poverty, but not actually poor. Some of the richest people that exist, some of the richest people that I've ever met in my life were poor. They might have had things, but they were rich in spirits, right? Think about what Jesus says. What is it profit of man if he gains the entire world, but loses his soul? Jesus is saying that there are things that are actually worth more than just the material things. Some people are so poor. Here's a, here's a line. You got to remember this. Tweet this, clip this, put this on your Instagram. There are some people who are so poor that the only thing that they have is money. Okay. Money does not bring happiness. Money does not bring joy. Money does not bring peace. Now it can help with those things in certain respects, but it's not the end all be all. So 
let me get back to your question. I've got to scroll back up. What does the Lord say about people suffering from not having money and in debt and being jealous of other people's possessions? First point is, don't be jealous of other people's possessions. Realize that there's true happiness and wealth. Uh, true happiness and joy comes from things that you cannot actually buy. It comes from having a relationship with Jesus. Now, what does it say about people ha not having money and those are in debt? That's actually your role and my role. The church says that we should be generous. Not the church says. The Bible says that the church, the body of believers, should be generous and kind to people who don't have much. Pure and undefiled religion is this. James chapter 4 let me pull this up so I can just not quote it. James chapter 4 and verse 17 says this. Oh, where'd it go? Am I still in? Oh, I went to James 5. My mistake. Uh, nope, that's not the one. Oh, I misquoted. See, this is why you don't believe anything I say ever. You got to see it in the text. Uh, is it James 2? Pure and undefiled religion. Where is it? Someone help me in the chat. You guys know the one I'm talking about. Or is it, no, it's James 1. There it is. 1, 27, not 4. Okay. James chapter 1, verse 27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Visit the orphans and widows in their afflictions to keep one unstained from the world. In other words, what the scripture teaches in this verse and in many other verses, the whole point, or maybe not the whole point, but one of the major things that we are called to do as the body of Christ is to be part of relieving the suffering of others. So what do we do when there's poor people out there, when people who don't have food, when they don't have anything, we go and we be the solution. Jesus said that that in the end of days, uh, many will come and Jesus will allow them in the kingdom. He says, because you, you, you clothed me, you fed me, you, you, you gave me water. And they'll say, when did we do this? When did we do this? Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me as well. What do we do? What does the Lord say? You and I need to be the solution to this problem in the world. Good questions. Israel Mora says, can I see your Bible? The closest Bible that I have next to me is this one. It's my phone. Or I guess technically the computer, which is right here in front of me, but I can't show you the computer. Do I have a physical Bible near me? Um, no, my physical Bible is in the car from church this weekend. Unfortunately, I don't have that one. Um, let's see. Zach, how do I share my faith with people that don't believe in Jesus Christ? Great question, Zach. So one major thing that I would say is you have to build a relationship with them. This is where I always start. I know it's the part that you don't actually care for. You want the nuts and uh, bolts. You want the nitty gritties, the ABCs, the one, two, three, but it really starts with a relationship. If you're not the kind of person that this person would just call up and say, hey, how's it going? Or, or if you're not the kind of person that says, man, I really appreciate that you've been there for me. Like if you're not that person to this person, then you don't really have any business witnessing to them. Uh, witnessing always exists within the confines of a relationship, at least when it's done properly, when it's done healthfully, when it's done well. Jesus drew close to people and tried to reach out to them because uh, he cared for them first and then he wanted to help change their lives, okay? So you gotta have a relationship. The second thing I would say is you wanna learn how to share your faith, not by saying things, but instead by asking questions. All the best times that I've had experience uh, witnessing successfully to someone, I've always led with asking a question instead of making a statement. And this, will, this is the reason why. It's because it shows that you're not only interested in talking to them, but you're also interested in listening to them. And that's one of the major keys when it comes to witnessing and sharing your faith. Learn to ask good questions, not to only just preach and talk and talk and talk. My goodness, my nose is insanely itchy. Every once in a while this happens when like allergies are going terrible. If you've been wondering why I've been scratching my nose a bunch, it's because it's super, super itchy. I don't know what is going on. Oh, the more I scratch it, the more red my nose is going to get. So I got to stop. I got to get self-control. My nose. Okay. Great perspective there. Hat wearing gamer. Be quick to listen. Flow to speak. Perfect verse for this time. I'm going to turn on the fan real quick. Give me a second. All right, I just turned on the fan. Let me know if that's too loud, if the you can hear the fan through the microphone. All right. Hopefully that works. All right. More questions. Keep them coming, guys. We got a, we got a good flow going on. I'm, I'm having fun right now. Uh, Zenprox, thanks so much. Your videos have changed my whole entire life. You have made a massive impact in my life right now. I get to see what God's plan is throughout my day. I feel so close to him. Awesome. That is such a cool testimony. I'm totally clipping that so I can have that as a memento and a reminder when I get discouraged because sometimes I do get discouraged. I'm not, the, I'm not like perfect out here, but I really appreciate that kind of word. Uh, and I'm glad that the ministry has been a blessing to you. Thank you very much for that. 
Uh, someone's asking, where was the verse? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Where is that found? That is found in James chapter 1, which wasn't too far from where we were earlier. Uh, let's go ahead and go to James chapter 1, and it is... Verse 19, know this, my beloved brother, and let every person be quick to speak, to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Very good, good stuff, good stuff. All right, I think the world would be a better place if we did this more. Has Justin answered the legalism question? Yes, I did answer a legalism question. I don't know if it was the legalism question, but I did answer one. Y'all have to scrub back to earlier in this episode if, uh, if you want to check that out. Um, Todd giving some advice to Zach. I appreciate this one. Just being a friend is someone doing activities with them. Many times Christians feel that they need to constantly talk about God. Just being there for someone in their time of need. Perfect. Exactly what I was saying, Todd. Love it. Um, Lilia, uh, Lil, Lil, Lila. So grateful to God for people like you who are not afraid and bold. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. What made me want to start a YouTube channel? I wanted to start a YouTube channel because I wanted to document my walk with God. I wanted to share my journey and record my journey. I've always heard that journaling was a really good, important practice that it helps you pray better and just process everything that's going on spiritually better. But I hate writing. I hate writing so very much. But as you can tell, I enjoy talking. And so I thought that maybe recording my journey and having like a video diary, a vlog of my walk with God would be a better way to do it. And so that's kind of how I initially got started. Um, other questions. Let me know if I missed a couple questions because sometimes the chat goes by. I got to scroll through. Um, oh, here's a good question. CJ is asking, did your legalism drive you to be judgmental and act like a Pharisee? I feel like this sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. I was such a jerk. In many respects, I still am a jerk. I, I try to, to fix it. I try to wrestle with it. But my natural inclination, my natural my, my natural personality trait is I like to be very judgmental. I, I always uh, wrestle with, oh, I'm better than these other people. You know, I have this like sense of uh, elitism, the holier than thou kind of perspective. And so I wrestle with that a lot. That's something that um, I really feel like God has convicted me of, something that I really want to work on. And by the grace of God, I think I'm improving. But naturally speaking, I'm very judgmental and very pharisaical. And especially when I was like steeped in my legalistic season, like I know for a fact I did this. Like I meant, I had many friends, especially like in high school, that I ended up like basically burning bridges with them because I was such a jerk to them, like judging them on their music or what they did on the weekends and like all these like like all these exterior things that they might be important, but they're not really as important as having a relationship with Jesus. I would call them out on these little things. And as a result, I found that a lot of people didn't quite like that. And so I regret that. Um, I'm uh, glad that I've learned from that, hopefully. Um, I wish I never did it, but you know, it's one of those, it's, that's my past, it's my history. And the thing that I can do moving forward is to try my best never to do it again. Yeah. How do you explain that Christianity does not just exist to be a comfort to people? The kinds of people that say that Christianity is just to like comfort people, they really don't, they don't, they don't understand what Jesus is asking. Let me give you an example. Um, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 16, and let's go to, is it 20? Oh, past it. Past it. Past it. There you go. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Notice the words of Jesus. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now today, the cross is like this cute uh, artifact. It's this cute like necklace that we have. It's just a symbol. Back then, a cross was a very offensive thing. The cross was an execution device. This is what they killed criminals, the worst of the worst on. And, and Jesus is saying, pick up your cross because you're gonna have to die. Follow me. Check this out. It goes on to say, uh, for whoever would save his life would lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, what Jesus is saying is the call to being a Christian is to give up everything. It's not, not, it's not a, a comforting thing. This is a sacrifice. This is a calling. This is like for you to radically change your life. Think about the rich young ruler. Jesus said, sell everything that you have and then follow me. 
So those who think that Christianity is just about um, is just about being comforted and being happy, like they misunderstand the point. There is a truth that life with Jesus is better than life without Jesus, that I, that I have joy, right? An abundant life are some of the words that the scriptures talk about. But part of the truth is, is that, is that the Christian calling is hard, that it puts demands on your life and it takes sacrifice and it takes a bit of grit. So I would just say, you don't quite understand it if you don't know. Okay. Um, questions, questions, questions. Does uh, Israel ask the question, does Jesus talk about making amends? Yes, Jesus talks a lot about making amends. Um, this is one of the major things that Jesus cares about the most. It's about um, restitution. It's about reconciliation. This is like Jesus literally, or the Bible literally says uh, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Um, God definitely does want us to Reconcile. There's a really great uh, passage that we quote out of context all the time. You've heard this one before, right? Uh, Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Uh, and a lot of times you hear this at prayer meeting, at church, like, oh God, there's a dozen people, there's a hundred people. So we know that where two or three are gathered, you're here. Yes, that makes sense. God is there. But that's not what this verse is talking about. If you notice in context, Matthew 18 is, is talking about if your brother sins against you, okay? If your brother sins against you, you go and tell him your fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother, okay? Making amends, restitution. My nose is bugging the heck out of me. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know how to stop it. Verse 16, but if he doesn't listen, take one or two others with you that by, by every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This is where it then goes to say, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. God desires reconciliation of relationship. God desires that you and I learn how to forgive each other, learn how to uh, patch up broken relationships. Why? Because this is exactly what God's trying to do with us. When we hold on to hatred, when we hold grudges against other people, we are betraying the very God that has forgiven us. If God could forgive us for, let's say, a uh, hundred times, some hundred X, why could we never forgive someone just one X? The, the sins that someone has done against us are, are so small in comparison to the sins that we've done against God, and yet God has forgiven us. And so for us to not forgive someone else, to us to not make amends for someone else, we are rejecting the very grace that God has given us. God gives us grace and intends for us to go and give that grace to other people. Let's see here. My nose is going insane. Oh my goodness. It is horrible right now. Ah! Oh, my nose is going to be so red by the end of this. How is it looking right now? <laughs> it's getting red. I guess my favorite color is red as I talked about in this live stream. So maybe it's okay. Uh... God's original says this. I appreciate this message. Thanks, Justin. I enjoy your videos and live streams. I look forward to them every day. And I pray for you, your family, and your YouTube channel. The world needs more people like you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your prayers. Honestly, I really do appreciate your prayers. Uh, one of the biggest ways to support this ministry, if you can't do super chats or become a patron or anything else like that, is honestly, just pray for us. Pray for Emily, pray for me, pray for our ministry. Like that is like huge. And so when you say something like that, I'm like really, really grateful for that. All right. Um, there was a question. What are your thoughts on Catholicism? I began to learn a bit about the Catholic views on salvation, communion, etc., and I'm not completely sure what to think. Great question, Daniel. I am not Catholic, uh, so obviously I'm not Catholic for several reasons, but my general approach to Catholicism is Catholic people are great. Uh, I know a lot of great Catholic people. I think many Catholic people will go to heaven, but Catholicism as a system of belief, I have a lot of problems with. There are a lot of things that I disagree with quite strongly when it comes to the Catholic teaching and Catholic interpretation of the Bible. Some to mention are its views on uh, atonement for sins, uh, the role of the Pope, the role of saints and the Virgin Mary, um, you know, just like 
what else? Uh, their views on baptism, the Eucharist. Like there's a whole bunch of things that they do and they practice that I don't see in the scriptures. I have a lot of problems with, but uh, I don't know. Uh, while I say all that, again, I want to be clear. I think Catholic people are great people. I think many Catholics will be saved. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't have any major qualms with saying that. But if you're trying to go with what the Bible says, I think that Catholicism is not the way to go. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on the best way to stay motivated daily through Jesus? Smash time is asking. One great quote that I saw was that um, uh, motivation is like showering. You need to do it daily. And uh, when it comes to that, uh, you know, how do you say motivated in Christ? It's daily plugging into Jesus. It's daily plugging into the source of your power, recognizing that really the only good thing that you have in your life, the only thing, the only way for you to be good in the world and to, to, to make a difference is if you're plugged into the source of goodness, the source of power. And so reconnecting to God through prayer, through study, through meditation, through fellowship, through service, all these things are super important. And so staying connected to God for sure. Rob R., do you believe some people are destined to go to hell? It depends on what you mean by the word destined. We talked a little bit about that on the live stream yesterday. I don't believe in predestination. I believe in free choice. I believe everyone will end up where they intend to end up. That if you truly love God and truly have a heart to follow after him and choose to follow after him, that God will honor that decision and, and you will be in the kingdom. If you want to choose the route of selfishness and you don't want to choose God, you want to do things on your own and you don't want to be connected to God who is the source of life, God will respect that and say, okay, you don't, want to, you don't want to be connected to me, then you're free to go. It breaks God's heart every time, but he will allow you to leave. So no, I don't believe people are destined to go to hell. I think everyone chooses to go to hell or chooses to go to heaven. Um, Let's see. Uh, Hannah's asked a good question. I've heard that some people say that there can be greater damnation in hell for certain people or sin. I want... I was wanting to know your opinion on this if you can. I don't believe that there will be... Um, so how do I want to say this? Because this, this opens up like a whole, um, a whole can of worms. Um, what do I want? To, there's, I'm thinking of the verse that I want to share with you guys. Here's what I'll say. I'll say this. I'm going to share one verse. There's like a whole theology behind this. I don't have, I don't want to like dive into this. Maybe I'll have to make a video about this, but the TLDR is this. I think the notion that God burns people forever and ever is not only offensive, but it's erroneous. It's wrong. I actually don't believe that that's what the scripture t talks about. Um, there are verses that would suggest it. I understand. I'm sympathetic to that, but I think that the actual teaching of the scriptures that that is that, um, ultimately the punishment comes to an end and the wicked cease to exist. Consider Malachi chapter four. And again, I realize that there is a lot of questions that will come from this, but Malachi chapter four, verses one through three, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven when all the arrogant, all the evil doers will be stubble. That word stubble is really important. What I have on my face is not a beard. It's stubble. It's just little, it's little bits of nothing. If you're going to go hiking, and then you can go light a fire because you need to get warm and roast your marshmallows. You start the fire with stubble. You don't start the fire with a giant log because why? It doesn't burn. Stubble burns up quickly and then it's done. It's, it's burned up and it goes away and it's used in, in, in a moment, okay? So it says, that day is coming, shall set, uh, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, and it will leave them neither root nor branch. After the stubble is burnt up, there will be no more roots, no more, no more branches, okay? The, which makes sense. Stubble burns up and then it's gone. And I think the same thing is true for the wicked. When they are, when they are subjected to the fires um, of, of hell, they actually won't be burning forever. They will be consumed. Neither root nor branch will remain. It goes on to say later on, you will tread uh, down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soul of your feet on the day that I act, says the Lord. Again, things that are burnt up, that are fully consumed, get turned into ashes. So the fact that the, the, the wicked would be turned into ashes lends us to the idea that their punishment comes to an end when they are ultimately consumed. So in a certain sense, are there logs or branches that take longer to, 
burn if we're using that analogy which I, I'm, I'm not too sure is the actual way it happens yes but at the end of the day all of it is consumed at the end it's all done away with and so in my perspective there might be varying degrees of punishment and even then i'm uncomfortable with that word i don't know that that's the best word to talk about it um but there's varying degrees of it but at the end of it all all the wicked have the same end they are consumed they're done away with they cease to exist that's my opinion i know that this is a whole can of worm you probably have like a hundred other questions about that but it's far more nuanced and i would want to uh like actually make a full video on the subject to make sure i do it justice great question thank you for uh putting me on the spot and challenging me to articulate that well um <laughs> missy is there such a thing as christian flirting i have heard the question many times from a lot of people and i don't know what to tell them i don't know what christian flirting will look like i don't see how flirting as a christian would be any different than flirting as a non-christian maybe perhaps less like sexual might be christian flirting but i don't i don't know I, I don't think that that's a real thing andrew i've been con uh, convicted to start talking about the talk about hell with the idea that god is fire yeah that's that's clear the bible says that god is a consuming flame we look at shadrach meshach and abednego and where was god god was literally in the flame and it was when they were in the flame that they were not burned it's a very interesting i have a whole thing on this andrew i'd love to talk with you about i believe that the people who are actually uh burned in the fire forever and ever they're not the wicked they're the righteous i know that sounds crazy that the the righteous are the people that burn in hell forever and ever not the wicked you see that in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I think that you see that many more times in the scriptures. I'd love to talk to you about that, Andrew. I know that you and I share some common beliefs. Um, I think there'd be stuff to talk about for that. Um, God's original. Justin, do you ever get overwhelmed by so many hard questions? Yes and no. Obviously, uh, not knowing the answer to a question can be stressful. And like, what do I say? Like, how do I answer this? And even when I do have some thoughts to the question knowing how to articulate that and how to share an answer that's reasonable that's relatable that will be a blessing like that can be stressful but also on the other side of that no because the reality is i'm i'm okay saying i don't know in fact you've heard me say it multiple times in the last couple of weeks when we we're doing live streams i'll say i don't know the answer and i don't feel like that's a bad thing because the reality is i don't know the answer and there's a lot of things that I don't know about. And that's why for me, this is more about a journey of discovering God and experiencing God for myself. And it's not really like this, this thing that I have to figure out all the time before I can share it with you. Anyways, uh, we got 52 minutes into this live stream. We'll go for another eight minutes. We'll end right around the hour mark. If you're watching us right now, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit that subscribe button so you know when the next video is coming out. Do me a favor, help us get this, this, this video promoted in the YouTube algorithms so we can actually share this word with other people. If you've been enjoying the live stream, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button. Let me know. All righty, let's see. We got a couple more questions. Uh, okay uh, what about women co-pastors like the belonging co-church in nashville okay so i actually don't have a problem with women pastors i know that a lot uh, a, a number of christians do i respect that decision i used to hold that position but i don't anymore um i just see that holding the position that women should not have authority and should not teach in a church as being very very inconsistent with the narrative that we see in the scriptures the scriptures talk a lot about women disciples and apostles the bible even talks about women uh, uh prophetesses um you think about Miriam, who led the uh the israelites as a prophetess um and so when i think about this who has more authority who has greater responsibility from god is it a pastor or is it a prophet or prophetess? In my perspective, and I could be wrong about this, I feel like the role of, if the role of pastor is here, the role of prophet is probably here. It's another notch above that. And so because I see women prophetesses and other reasons, I don't have a problem with women pastors or women teachers in the church. I think that that's actually okay. And when the Bible says that I do not permit a, a woman to teach or have any authority over man, I think that's a cultural thing that we need to interpret carefully and contextually. I don't think that's applicable across the broad spectrum of Christianity. Good question. Uh, here's another one. Is it normal to just want to worship and bow in reverence all the time? People say I'm weird because that's all I want to do. No, I don't think that's weird. 
Um, I think that people respond to God in worship in different ways. Some people, they want to bow, uh, bow down prostrate and they want to, to be on their knees. Some people want to stand and lift their hands. Some people just want to stand still. Some people sway back and forth. It's, it's different for everyone. I don't think it's really a big deal. The, what matters the most is that your heart is responding to God in worship. I think that's really the, the part that I would say, hey, great job, keep on doing it. Do I ever feel the need to like be on the floor, prostrate, head down, like all that kind of stuff? Not so much. I can't say that there have been many moments where I felt like that. There have been a handful, but it's not my common experience. Um... <laughs> Genesis, you punk, dude. Okay, Gen Pod says that handsome vlogger. Genesis is a friend of mine from California, and he does, he used to. Genesis, you have been burying your talents, my friend. Consider this a, a formal rebuke and uh, a call from God to re enter the digital mission field. Genesis used to run a Facebook live stream very similar to this, answering questions and doing Bible studies online. And every time he would do that, I would always troll in the comments and make fun of him just to try and distract him and throw him off his game. So Genesis, thank you for hanging out. It's been a while since I've seen you in person, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Uh, thank you for calling me that handsome vlogger. That's very kind of you. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, let's see right here. Oh, Andrew says Romans 16, 7 talks about a female apostle. There you go. Very good um cj is uh, talking about the ways that he worships sometimes i walk around and pray i agree sometimes not sometimes most of the time that i'm praying it has to be while i'm walking or doing something i just i can never just do the whole bow your head close your eyes you know don't move kneel like i have way too much add as evidenced by this video today especially with my nose going crazy um walking and praying is for me has always been something that i've really really valued any book good books to read of course i'm going to plug this book again thank you for the opportunity letters to the church by francis chan doing a 10-part series on it first part's already released check out the book it's incredible if you watch the first video that i posted there is a link in the description for a free copy of the book check it out you get it for free why wouldn't you want it and it's an incredible book um let's see Vivi says, oh, I like this comment. I believe God can use anybody to spread his word, no matter what race or gender authority is given to the righteous. Solid point. I love that. Oh, by the way, I get I get a lot of flack for doing this motion. People say, oh, this is Illuminati or it's like 666 or whatever the case is. No, this is American Sign Language for okay. Okay, so this isn't like cultic or anything like that. I reject that on the face of it all. Like, no. This simply means okay. So when I say like, oh, great comment, I'm, I'm, I'm affirming. It's like I'm doing a thumbs up. It's the same thing. It's not like a spiritual thing. If you're like that, you're crazy, okay? If you, you clearly don't know me at all. I get these comments. I get them at least like once a month. Someone saying, hey, you shouldn't do this sign because, oh, it's cultic, it's satanic. Baloney, no, I reject it. I dropped something, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Illuminati. Justin Illuminati confirmed. I know. It's ridiculous. The kinds of things that people say, like, it's just so ignorant. Like, how could you conceive of calling someone who quits his job to do full-time ministry, works every single day to create content that will bless people, answer their questions, pray for them. How could you say Illuminati? Like, what? Like, seriously. Like, how, how can you? Like, that just, it doesn't make sense at all. Oh, it's F in sign language. So how does, okay, so how does this, the okay sign? I've always heard it as okay. No, see, Wikipedia says that when you join the thumb, how do I, how do I show you guys my screen? Um, hold on. Is this possible? Let me try and, I'll show you what I'm looking at because I'm pretty sure this is the sign for okay. Um, if I do... Let's try a full screen ad. No. See, see me just showing you guys my Chrome is like this whole process. Did this work? Uh, nope. Oh, wait. I could probably fix it doing this. Uh, okay sign. Ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, and then how do I add that? Oh, I got to reorder this. I apologize. I know that this isn't really the most compelling content in the whole world. Okay. And then I got, oh, I got to reorder the camera on top. Okay. And then I'm going to have to shift over here. Okay. Check this out. 
Uh, according to Wikipedia, the OK gesture. Oh, that's kind of small. You guys can't read that, can you? Let me. The OK gesture. Uh, the OK or ring gesture is performed by connecting the thumb and the index finger into a circle and holding the other finger straight or relaxed in the air. Commonly used by divers, it signifies I am OK or are you OK when underwater? Oh, shoot. The cropping on this is off. How do I go back here? I got to make sure that you guys can see this. You know what? I'm just going to put it full screen and not worry about. Oh, see, now everything's going to be a problem. Um, Chrome above cam link. Okay, there we go. And then transition. Okay, see this, this, how do I, this right here is the okay sign. Commonly used by divers, it signifies I am okay or are you okay when underwater. It's been used in this content for some time. In the US, it denotes approval, agreement that all is well or okay. So, no, not Illuminati. And maybe it is also the letter F uh, in uh, sign language. I don't know. But it is a commonly accepted practice for the word okay. I just spent a lot of time talking about that whole thing on okay. I apologize that. Some think, some thinks, CJ says, it means some white power thing too. Absurd. It might be. I don't know. But that's not how I'm using it. Clearly, that's not me. So, to all you haters out there wrong false oh it says gesture not sign language okay so that's where i got it wrong it might be the letter f in sign language but it's also a gesture for okay um all right well we are officially at one hour um i'm gonna close down the live stream here thank you guys so, so much for hanging out with me do me a favor again if you haven't already like the video subscribe and i will see you guys tomorrow in our next live stream 5 p.m pacific standard time i will do my best to be on time uh, and to be in a place where there's good Wi-Fi. Apologize for the hiccups earlier today. Appreciate the patience from you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. Um, again, check out some of the videos I posted earlier. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And if you have a subject you want me to make a video about, just let me know, and I'll do my best to uh, to oblige to your requests. I'd like to say until next time, I'm that Christian vlogger, and I encourage you to experience faith in the first person. God bless.